Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Terry Brooks, a young woman from Pennsylvania who was horrifically murdered actually at her place of work one night in the mid 80s. When a homicide investigation began into Terry's death, the police weren't really sure on suspects or theories as to who might have done this to Terry. However, one by one, it seemed as though they were able to rule everyone out as being the perpetrator and tragically her case went cold. But years and years after the crime, when the case was reopened, eventually a new suspect emerged in the investigation and with that came the realization that actually this killer had been hiding in plain sight this entire time. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to HelloFresh for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service and they offer a huge variety of delicious recipes every single week which can be delivered straight to your door. I've said it before but I'll say it again, the thing that I love the most about HelloFresh is that they are so convenient and they save you so much time when it comes to cooking in the evenings, which is a Send, especially around this time of year. Obviously it's December now, we're officially in the festive season, there are only a couple of weeks till Christmas and whilst this is definitely my favourite time of year, it's always the busiest. I feel like in the run up to Christmas I'm just rushing around all the time trying to get so much done. But with HelloFresh I know that at least my evenings are stress free because they make cooking at home simple and quick. With HelloFresh you just pick the meals that you would like to try on their website and they will send you the instructions on how to make the meal and a box full of all of the pre-portioned ingredients that you will need. But you can also pause your deliveries or change the amount of portions that you will need week to week. You can cancel your subscription whenever you want to, so you're not tied down, you can be completely flexible. And at the moment, HelloFresh are offering a variety of festive meals, perfect to enjoy when you're having a little cozy night in with your loved ones. I recently had HelloFresh's fajita chicken loaded wedges. Not necessarily festive, I know, but I just had to mention it because, oh my god, it was phenomenal. Definitely one of my favourite meals, or maybe my favourite meal that I've ever had from HelloFresh big statement but I'm putting it out there. So if you would like to check out HelloFresh for yourself then the link to their website will be down below in the description box and for those of you who also live in the UK you can use the discount code MW60 for 60% off of your first box and then 25% off of your next eight boxes and you can also scan the QR code that is on the screen right now to receive that offer too. Thank you so much once again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. It's always a pleasure working with you guys. Thank you so much to all of you watching for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just quickly before we continue, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young woman and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women as well as topics such as domestic abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back almost four decades now to early 1984 in Falls, Township, which is an area located in Bucks County in the state of Pennsylvania in the US. And this is Terry Lynn Brooks. She was a 25 year old woman who lived in Pennsylvania. Terry was born on the 13th of September 1958 to her parents George and Frances Brooks and she was one of four children, the oldest of four siblings. I know that one of her siblings was called Vicky but unfortunately I couldn't find the names of the other two online. Terry's parents George and Frances Francis separated. They got a divorce when Terry was around her early teenage years, which I can imagine was probably a tough time for the family, tough for the kids to adjust to this change in their life. But Terry's younger sister, Vicky, said that Terry was basically just wonderful with her siblings during this time. She really kind of took them under her wing and cared for them and almost became like a second mother figure to them. She was just a really, really good big sister. Growing up, Terry was described as 
being a very happy and cheerful and sociable young girl. She found it very easy to make friends and chat to people and she had a lot of ambition. She was very hard working. Following high school, Terry went on to go to college and she also began working as a waitress. I think she had worked in a couple of different restaurants and ultimately she had decided that that was what she wanted to do career-wise. She wanted to be in the food and restaurant industry and kind of work her way up in that field. So as I said, she initially worked as a waitress and then eventually she managed to secure herself a management position, which by the sounds of it, she absolutely thrived in. As I mentioned before, she was a very, very sociable and chatty person. So she was perfect for customer service and she was very hardworking and headstrong. So she had the skill set to be able to manage others and be very organized and stuff. So career-wise, she was doing extremely well for herself. And it was while she was working when she met and fell in love with one of her colleagues. She met a guy named Alfred Scott Keefe, although I believe he mostly went by his middle name, Scott. So I'll probably refer to him as Scott throughout this video. He worked as a chef at one of the restaurants that Terry had worked at. And yeah, they just got on really well. They started dating and they actually got engaged. Very quickly too, I think they were engaged. Terry's family did feel as though it was quite sudden, but you know, if Terry was happy, then they were happy for her. She and Scott just fell madly in love with each other and knew that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together. So Scott asked Terry if she would marry him and Terry said yes. And I believe they planned to get married sometime in the summer of 1984. Terry was said to be very, very excited. She couldn't wait to do things like going wedding dress shopping and finding dresses for her bridesmaid. She was looking forward to their honeymoon. I think they planned to go to Hawaii. Meanwhile, Terry was still moving on to bigger and better things in her work life and she eventually secured a new role working as the evening or night manager for a Roy Rogers restaurant. The restaurant was in an area called Fairless Hills in Bucks County and she was said to be a very good boss. She was the kind of boss that was very happy and very nice but also fair. Like she would not take any messing about. If you were a good worker, a reliable worker, there would be no problems and you would get on with Terry really well. But if you weren't, if you messed about, then she was not afraid to pull you up on it and put you in your place, which is really the way that every manager should be, I suppose. She wouldn't take any crap, basically. And actually working at the restaurant was exactly what Terry Brooks had been doing on the day that this case occurred. It was the 3rd of February, 1984 and that day Terry was working the evening shift at the Roy Rogers restaurant which I guess was part of her usual routine by this point. As I said before she was the night manager so she was used to working the late night shifts. It was something that she had done countless times before. However this time appeared to be different because this time for some reason Terry actually never returned home. It was the following morning, the morning of the 4th of February 1984 when Terry Terry's fiance drove past her house, her father and stepmother's house, and he realised that Terry's car wasn't parked outside. Now, as I understand it, even though they were engaged, Terry and Scott didn't actually live together yet. Terry still lived at her father's house and Scott still lived with his parents. But apparently they were apartment hunting in the lead up to this case taking place, but they just hadn't found somewhere yet. So yeah, anyway, back to that morning. So Scott was in his car, actually on his way to his work that morning. He worked at another restaurant, I think. And as he drove past Terry's parents' house, he noticed that Terry's car wasn't there. It wasn't parked in the driveway, which he thought was strange. So he pulled up, he got out of his car and knocked on the door and asked Terry's family if she was home because her car wasn't outside. And when they checked Terry's bedroom, they realised that she wasn't. She wasn't sleeping in her bed. It seemed as though she didn't come home from work the previous night. So concerned, Terry's father George grabbed the phone and he rang the Roy Rogers restaurant where Terry worked and when someone answered George asked if his daughter Terry was still there was she okay however the person on the other end of the line actually said 
no, she's not okay. In fact, she's been murdered. Earlier that same morning at around 6 a.m., one of the other managers of the same Roy Rogers restaurant where Terry worked, he arrived at the restaurant ready to open up for the day. And that was when he made an absolutely horrifying discovery. When he walked into the kitchen area of the restaurant, he stumbled upon a young woman lying on the floor. She was lying on her back, so she was face up. She was in a pool of blood and she was dead. Of course, this young woman was 25 year old Terry Brooks. Terry had been viciously attacked and murdered at her place of work. So as soon as the manager found Terry's body, he immediately called the police who quickly arrived at the scene. And it was, I believe not long after this, when Terry's father, George, contacted the restaurant after realizing that his daughter wasn't home. And of course, that was when he learned of the awful news. He was told over the phone that Terry had been killed. The way that Terry's body had been left in the restaurant made it very, very obvious to the police when they arrived that yes, this was a homicide that they were dealing with. As I mentioned, she was lying in a pool of her own blood from where she had been stabbed in the neck with a knife. And in fact, when she was found, the knife was still plunged in her neck. It was a butcher's knife actually from the restaurant kitchen and it was just sticking out of her neck. In addition to this, she was absolutely covered in bruises, likely from where she had tried to defend herself, from where she tried to find off her attacker and she also had bruises around her neck, bruises that literally looked like hand impressions and hand marks from where she had been strangled. However, when her autopsy was later performed, it was determined that Terry's official cause of death was probably asphyxiation. She had suffocated from this trash bag that had been placed around her head, which heartbreakingly the police concluded was probably the last thing that the killer did to her. So it was clear that a violent struggle had occurred between Terry and her attacker, hence all the bruises. She'd also been strangled. She sustained that stab wound to her neck, which the pathologist believed wouldn't have killed her. It would have just paralyzed her. So she was no longer able to fight back. And in addition to this, it was also concluded that she had suffered a brain hemorrhage from where it's thought the attacker had Terry down on the ground and he began banging her head on the kitchen floor, the hard concrete floor repeatedly. But even after sustaining all of those horrific injuries, she was still alive. She may have been unconscious, but she was alive. And it's believed that that was when the plastic trash bag was secured around her head and she died from suffocation. And the reason that they were able to tell that she was still alive when the bag was placed over her head was because there was moisture inside of the bag from where she had been breathing from her breath. The police also observed at the scene that Terry's shoes had been kicked off. They were discovered in the kitchen not far from where Terry's body lay. So it was theorized that perhaps that was where the attack began, where her shoes were. The killer used such force with Terry, pushing her around with such force that her shoes actually came off. But although her shoes were not on her feet, the police did notice that she was wearing her coat, her big winter coat. Now, obviously, she wouldn't usually wear this coat while she was working. And so for that reason, the police theorized that perhaps she was attacked literally as she was leaving the restaurant that night to go home. She was killed after the restaurant had closed that evening, sometime after midnight, and there were no signs of forced entry, which indicated that Terry must have let her killer in or they forced her to let them in. So the police thought that perhaps she was just leaving the restaurant. She was just looking up and when she walked out the front door that was when she was confronted by the killer and probably threatened and forced back inside and they forced her back inside because their intention was to rob the place. It didn't take long for the police to conclude that Terry's murder was likely part of a robbery attempt because the other manager was able to tell the police that about $2,500 had been taken from the safe in the office. The safe had been opened and it had 
just been emptied and as well as that Terry's purse was near her body and that had been emptied. The contents of her purse was just all over the floor so yeah it really seemed as though this was a burglary and that Terry was probably killed so that she wouldn't be able to go to the police. Maybe she knew the attacker or she had seen the attacker's face and so they decided that she had to die or else she may be able to later identify them and it's believed that the killer escaped through the drive through window. The restaurant had a drive through which would have been shut by the time Terry was killed because the restaurant would have been closed. However, when the other manager and the police got to the scene the following morning, they discovered that it was partially open from the inside. So it was theorized that this was how the killer got out of the building after robbing the place and murdering Terry. Now, as well as the police being dispatched to the scene, forensics were also sent to the restaurant to search for any potential DNA evidence that the killer may have left behind. They dusted the scene for fingerprints and skin and hair samples were also collected from Terry's body, particularly from underneath her fingernails. Apparently they detected traces of blood and skin underneath her fingernails, which they thought may have come from the murderer, from where Terry was trying to fight back. She was scratching at her killer. However, of course, what you have to remember was that this was the early to mid 80s and DNA and forensic technology was barely a thing yet. It was in its very, very early days. So at this moment in time, this kind of evidence wasn't really going to be usable. They wouldn't be able to identify the killer through DNA just yet. But the investigation into Terry's murder began nonetheless, and the police began speaking to and looking into the people in Terry's life. Of course, one of the first people that they looked at was Terry's fiance, Scott Keith. They spoke to him and they asked him what he was doing on the night that his partner was killed. And he said that he was just at his home asleep in bed. I believe he actually said that he felt so, so guilty because usually when Terry was working a night shift, he would always go to the restaurant and wait with her after the restaurant closed as she was like cashing up and locking up because he didn't like the thought of her being there on her own so late at night. But on this particular night, the night of the murder, he hadn't gone to meet Terry at the restaurant because he had a very early shift at the restaurant where he worked the following morning. So he stayed home and went to bed because he knew that he would have to be up early the next day. So he felt so bad that the one time he wasn't there with Terry was the time when she was attacked and killed. He wasn't there to protect her. As well as speaking to Scott, the police also spoke to the rest of her loved ones. They spoke to Terry's parents and just asked if they could think of anyone in their daughter's life that perhaps held a grudge against her, that might have wanted to do this to her. But they said no, there was absolutely no one that would have wanted Terry dead because she was such a nice, friendly person. Although it was when the police looked father into her working life when actually a couple of potential suspects did start to emerge in the case. So obviously as part of their investigation detectives also began taking statements from her colleagues from the restaurant and asking them if they could think of anyone that didn't like Terry very much. Had there been any workplace conflicts for example that she had been involved in and actually there had been. Quite a few of her colleagues mentioned to the police that there was one guy who held a strong resentment towards Terry Brooks and his name was Steve Daly. Now Steve Daly used to work at the Roy Rogers restaurant as a chef however he caused a lot of problems there to be honest. He was described as being very hot-headed, he would lose his temper quite often with his fellow colleagues so a lot of them didn't like working with him. He just made it a not very nice environment to work in and I believe he would also just disobey Terry a lot. His boss. He wouldn't follow her rules or procedures. And as I mentioned earlier on, Terry was not a pushover when it came to her management style. If someone like Steve was causing a problem in the workplace, she was not the type to just ignore it. She would address it and iron out any problem. She would confront Steve about his behaviour. But this just led to many arguments between them, to be honest. During one argument, Steve even called Terry a bitch. And so, ultimately, Terry actually decided decided to fire Steve Daly. He was fired just a couple of weeks before Terry was brutally murdered. However, fellow colleagues actually told the police that even though Steve had been fired, 
that did not stop him from coming to the restaurant. There were numerous occasions where after he was sat, he would come to the restaurant, sit down, order food. It almost seemed as though he was trying to annoy Terry and also intimidate her, maybe make her feel like he was watching her or something. I can imagine that it probably made her really uncomfortable. So it was upon learning all of this when Steve Daly became a pretty solid suspect in the case because he seemed to have a possible motive. In his eyes, Terry was the reason why why he lost his job. So was this an act of revenge? Did he kill Terry Brooks because he was angry at her for sacking him? So Steve was asked to come down to the police station to be interviewed and he he fully admitted that yeah he did not have a good relationship with Terry Brooks. He strongly disliked her. He even said at one point in his interview that if she wasn't a woman he would have hit her. That's how much he did not like her. The police asked Steve why he kept going back to the restaurant after he was fired and he apparently said that it was because he was dating one of the other workers there so he would go back to see them. Although I don't think the police really brought that, it seemed more likely that he kept going back because as I said before he wanted to intimidate Terry. But whilst he admitted that yeah he pretty much despised Terry Brooks, he completely denied being the one who murdered her and so the police asked him where he was on the night in question. And and he said that he had apparently tried to get into a nightclub that evening but that he was unable to, they wouldn't let him in or something and the police tried to verify this story but they couldn't. He didn't have a concrete enough alibi to be able to be ruled out and so they asked him to undergo a polygraph test which he did and he passed this test which indicated to the police that he was being truthful. So at this moment in time that was enough for the police to not eliminate Steve Daly as a suspect entirely but kind of just set him to the side for now and think okay he probably wasn't the killer so we'll continue looking into other people of interest but he's still kind of on our radar. So the police carried on looking further into the other employees at the Roy Rogers restaurant. Specifically they looked into the members of staff who had been working with Terry on the evening that this case occurred and again there was one colleague in particular who ultimately became a pretty top suspect because of the fact that the police were able to match their fingerprint to a print that was found on the trash bag that was placed around Terry's head during her murder. The trash bag that caused her to suffocate to death and in addition to that their fingerprint was also found on the drive through window which if you remember the police theorised that this was the killer's escape room. So the police interviewed this colleague, they confronted him about this fingerprint evidence and his explanation was basically well I, I work there so of course you're going to find my fingerprints in the restaurant but I think it was the fingerprint on the trash bag that the police were most concerned about although he had an explanation for this too he actually said that one of his main duties every evening whilst they were cleaning the restaurant and getting it ready for the next day was to change the trash take out the trash bag and put a new one in the bin and so he said that that's why his prints would have been found on the trash bag that was around Terry's head. And to be honest, the police were never able to find any other evidence to implicate this colleague. His explanations for the fingerprints were obviously plausible and they were able to confirm his alibi for after he left the restaurant that evening before Terry was killed. So he was more or less eventually ruled out. As were the other employees that were also working that evening. They were all thoroughly looked into, their alibis were checked and they too were eliminated as suspects in the case. So now that the majority of people in Terry's life had been looked into and more or less ruled out, the police strongly suspected that Terry's killer was most likely a stranger to her and that her murder was part of a robbery attempt. As the evidence suggests, as we know, about $2,500 had been stolen from the restaurant that night. And this actually wasn't that uncommon. Restaurant robberies around around this time were happening pretty frequently in the area and surrounding areas. Of course it wasn't often that someone was brutally murdered during them but there had been a string of restaurant robberies back in the mid 80s. It must have been a pretty scary time to work as a restaurant employee especially if you were working the evening shifts like Terry did and about two weeks after Terry's murder it seemed as though another very similar attack had occurred at another Roy Rogers 
Rogers restaurant. So the police wondered whether these two cases were linked. Now I'm not entirely sure exactly where this Roy Rogers restaurant was, but I believe it was in an area not too far from the Roy Rogers where Terry worked in Furnace Hills. And as I said, a couple of weeks after Terry was killed, the assistant manager of this Roy Rogers restaurant was brutally attacked by someone as she was walking out of the bathroom. She was beaten and hit around the head before the attacker quickly fled the scene. And I'm not sure if the attacker actually stole anything from the restaurant or if perhaps he was in the process of doing this as the assistant manager came out of the bathroom, but when she did, he quickly fled after he attacked her. Fortunately, the assistant manager did survive this attack, but unfortunately, the attacker was never traced. And then just days after this, there was yet another attack on a female restaurant employee. This case happened at a restaurant in or around the city of Scranton in Pennsylvania, which is just over 130 miles away from Fairless Hills. And one day in February of 1984, a young woman named Kathy Kermchak was working in the restaurant on her own. I'm assuming that she, like Terry Brooks, was maybe getting ready to lock up the restaurant or something. And as she was doing this, she was completely unaware that there was a man outside just watching her. He had waited until all of the other employees had left and now that Kathy was alone, he went inside of the restaurant. It's thought that he intended to rob the place, steal the money from the cash registers. However, the money had already been put inside the safe. And apparently, according to sources, Kathy was unable to access the safe. I'm guessing that she didn't know the combination, so she couldn't open it to be able to give this man the cash. And so instead of just leaving, the man proceeded to rob Kathy herself. He took her money and then he killed her. He took her into the lady's bathroom and it was there where he stabbed her repeatedly until she died. So because Kathy's murder took place literally a couple of weeks after Terry Brooks's death, the detective strongly suspected that the cases may have been connected, that they may have been killed by the same man because there were so many similarities between the cases. And luckily it wasn't long before the police over in Scranton made an arrest in Kathy Kamchak's case. They arrested a man named Steve Duffy, who, according to sources, was actually also an employee at the same restaurant as Kathy. So he intended to rob his own place of work, which we can guess is probably why he killed Kathy, because she obviously would have been able to tell the police exactly who the robber was. Steve Duffy was ultimately sentenced to death. He received the death penalty penalty for Kathy's murder. And following his arrest, he was interviewed by the detectives who were investigating Terry Brooks's case because they thought that he could have been her killer too. But he basically just refused to talk to them, refused to answer any questions, but they were able to obtain his fingerprint. And when his prints were compared to the evidence found at the crime scene, they didn't match. His prints didn't match any of the prints found at the scene. And with no concrete evidence tying Steve Duffy to Terry's murder, it seemed as though the police had hit yet another dead end with their suspect. And unfortunately, they weren't able to trace the perpetrator who had committed the attack on that other female employee at the other Roy Rogers restaurant either, the woman who survived. Nothing was really leading the police anywhere. They'd looked into numerous people, followed up on leads, try to link Terry's case to other attacks, but they were just coming up short. They couldn't positively identify the man who had committed this horrific crime. And so, as does happen naturally over the coming months, the investigation into Terry's murder started to wind down as the police had to start putting their time and effort into new cases. And so, sadly, Terry's case went cold. And it remained that way for literally years, for almost a decade and a half. There was just no movement in Terry's case and her poor family were left with no answers and no justice, which just breaks my heart. It must be awful for the families who go so, so long without knowing the truth. How they even managed to cope with that day to day is just beyond me. And yeah, the case remained unsolved, 
But then came 1998, so about 14 years after Terry's death that when a little glimmer of hope emerged in this investigation. You see, it was in 1998 when the Falls Township Police Department decided to dig out their old case files and basically go over all of the unsolved cases that had happened in their jurisdiction in the hopes that maybe they would now be able to solve some of them using the advancements in DNA and forensic technology that had happened by this point. And of course, one of these old cases that they decided to look back into was the 1984 murder of Terry Brooks. So all of the evidence related to Terry's case was taken out of storage and it was sent off for forensic testing. So for example, this included things like the knife that was found sticking out of Terry's neck and the samples that had been collected from her body shortly after her murder. Meanwhile, as all of that evidence was being re tested, the new detectives who had been assigned to the case began looking back into all of the people who were within Terry's circle. Her family, her friends, her co-workers, just in case her murder was in fact committed by someone that she knew. Because you see, the main theory in Terry's case had kind of always been that her murder was just part of a restaurant robbery and that she was killed by someone she didn't know. But I think it was almost hard to believe that in a way for these new detectives because when you look at the way in which Terry was killed, I mean she was beaten, she was stabbed, she was strangled, suffocated, the injuries that she sustained were so, so incredibly brutal and that suggested that actually this murder was personal. The amount of violence that the killer used during this attack indicated that they held some sort of grudge against Terry. They were angry at her for some reason and that's why her murder was so incredibly vicious. If her killer was a stranger and they murdered her because they just wanted to rob the place and they wanted to get rid of the only witness, don't you think it seems unlikely that they would have gone to such extremes to get the job done, for lack of a better term. Like I said, the amount of injuries that she had suggested that this was not a random killing. They suggested that whoever took Terry's life that night had a far stronger motive than just wanting the cash out of the safe there was a personal element to this crime. So when new detectives were put on the case in 1998, as well as sending off the old evidence for testing, they also decided that they needed to, I guess, just look through everyone again. As I said, all of her colleagues and friends and family and take new statements from people because maybe they would remember something significant that they hadn't told the police back in the mid 80s. And it was following this when they seemed to get the breakthrough that they needed. One of the people that the police spoke to again in 1998 was Terry's old boss, her manager, and they actually decided to show him some of the crime scene photos that were obviously taken back in February of 1984. And he hadn't seen these before. He was not shown these in the original investigation. But they decided to show him them now, just in case there was something in these pictures that perhaps seemed a bit odd to see if anything jumped out at him. And it did. You see, when he looked through these photos, Terry's manager noticed that in one of them, I believe it was a photo from the office, he noticed, well, a couple of things. He noticed that the office wasn't how Terry usually left it at the end of a shift. She was usually a very, very tidy and organized person. And she always left the office in a certain way. So for example, her boss said that she she would always leave the phone in a certain position. She would always make sure that all of the stationery was tidied away in a drawer. They had an ashtray in the office and at the end of every shift, Terry would make sure that she emptied it before she left. However, the manager noticed from the photograph of the office that on this particular night, the night of her murder, she hadn't done those things. She hadn't left the phone in the normal position. She hadn't cleared away the stationery off the desk. She hadn't emptied the ashtray. And this information stood out to the detectives immediately because if you recall from earlier on in the video, the theory was always that Terry had probably been approached and attacked by her killer literally as she was leaving the restaurant. She had finished doing all of her inventory for the night and everything and she was just about to lock up 
up and that was when she was confronted and forced back inside of the restaurant as she was walking out the door. But this information from her old boss now suggested otherwise. It suggested that she wasn't attacked as she was leaving because the picture from the office indicated that she wasn't finished for the night because she hadn't done her usual routine of clearing up the desk and emptying the ashtray, etc, etc. So that implied that she did in fact know her attacker and that she let them inside of the restaurant that night because if she hadn't been ambushed literally as she was leaving and there were no signs of forced entry, then she must have been comfortable enough with this person to allow them to come in while she was alone and getting everything ready for the following day. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, basically this new information from her old boss just added to the theory that Terry knew her attacker and so the police continued looking back into the people in her life. And as part of this line of inquiry, the detectives decided to kind of re-interview old friends of Terry's. I mean, I say re-interview, but some of the these friends apparently weren't actually spoken to by the police back in the 1984 investigation for some reason and it was upon speaking to these friends in particular when suddenly a new suspect emerged in the case someone who actually had kind of been hiding in plain sight all these years. You see, the police began asking these friends just questions about Terry and her life in the lead up to her murder. What was going on in her life? Had she confided in her friends about anything that was worrying her? And it turns out that she actually had. Before Terry was killed, she had apparently told some of her friends that her relationship with her fiance, Scott Keefe, was actually on the rocks. And in fact, she wasn't sure anymore whether she actually wanted to marry him. As previously mentioned, Terry and Scott apparently got engaged relatively quickly, it seemed, but although it was all very sudden, she seemed over the moon. She seemed so excited to get married and start a new chapter with Scott. Obviously, they were planning on tying the knot just a couple of months after Terry's murder in the summer of 1984. They were really looking for forward to their honeymoon, which they had apparently already paid some money towards. They both just seemed very, very happy. But Terry's friends told the police that actually this happiness was rather short-lived because soon cracks started to appear in their relationship. Problems arose, which seemed to include Scott feeling quite jealous of his fiance. You see, Terry was a very career-driven woman. We know this. She wanted to go far in her career, so she was putting in the work. She wanted to climb up the ladder in the kind of restaurant management industry and she was doing that. As we know, she was made the night manager of the Roy Rogers restaurant. So she was doing very well for herself. She was very successful. Whereas Scott was kind of the opposite. Sources seem to suggest that he, he wasn't very happy in his job as a chef at another restaurant. But he also didn't have the same kind of drive and motivation as Terry to do anything about it and go for his dream like she was, whatever his dream was. So yeah, there seemed to be a lot of jealousy on his part about that. But also Terry's friends said that additionally, Scott could be quite controlling of Terry, very possessive. He wouldn't like her going anywhere on her own. He had to know where she was at all times. If you remember from earlier on, I mentioned how Scott would usually go and meet Terry at the Roy Rogers restaurant towards the end of her night shift and he would try to make out like he was doing it to make sure that she was safe. He didn't want her to have to work there alone so late at night just in case anything happened. But in actual fact, it's believed that the real reason he would go was because of his possessive behaviour. As I said, he had to know where she was at all times. So him going to the restaurant wasn't necessarily him making sure that she was okay and safe. It was him checking on her, checking that she was where she said she would be. And clearly Terry reached a point where she had had enough of it. She'd had enough of Scott's jealousy and his controlling and abusive behaviour. And so 
yeah, she confided in some of her friends that she didn't know if she wanted to go through with the wedding. She didn't know if she wanted to be with Scott anymore. And this was brand new information for the police. There was nothing in Terry's old case files from 1984, which talked about these issues in their relationship. I guess because the people spoke to in Terry's life back then had no idea about it. As I understand it, she only confided in a couple of friends about her issues with Scott and these friends weren't spoken to by the police back in the 80s from what I can gather. It seems as though Terry didn't really speak to her family about these problems. In fact the police back in the 80s got the impression that her family really liked Scott Key. He was able to present himself to them as this really really loving and caring fiance who adored Terry but clearly they didn't see that other side of him so Terry's family never really considered him a suspect at all when they first learned that she had been murdered and so neither had the police at the time to be honest but not anymore now that the police in the late 90s had this information about Scott Keith they really thought that maybe he was the murderer the killer was right in front of their eyes this whole time maybe he killed Terry because she didn't want to be with him anymore she didn't want to marry him and so he decided well if I can't have you then no one can so Scott really did become the top suspect at this point but the issue was the police didn't actually have any solid evidence against him. They didn't have evidence to make an arrest, so they needed to find some. Now, by this point, obviously, all of the old evidence from the crime scene and from Terry's body had been sent off for forensic testing. And luckily, scientists had a breakthrough. They were able to detect traces of DNA from under Terry's fingernails, which were not a match to Terry. This DNA had come from an unknown male who the police believed was the killer. She had managed to get his DNA underneath her fingernails from where she was probably scratching at him and trying to defend herself. And in addition to this, scientists were also able to detect an unknown male's DNA profile from the knife that was sticking out of Terry's neck. They literally took apart this knife in the lab. They removed the blade from the wooden handle and they tested the material from within that gap. And that was when they found two two different DNA profiles. One was Terry's and the other was from an unknown male, which again, the police believed was the killer because this second DNA profile from the knife matched the DNA from underneath Terry's fingernail. So like I said, this was a huge breakthrough piece of evidence for the police. After more than 14 years, they finally had the murderer's DNA. They could use this to test against any potential suspects in the case. And and of course, the very first person that they wanted to test was Scott Keith. So they needed Scott's DNA, but the police didn't want to just go ahead and ask him for his DNA sample because then he might panic. They didn't have enough evidence to arrest him, so they couldn't force him to give his DNA. And if he realised that he was now a suspect in Terry's case and he was the killer, then he might flee. He might go on the run. And the police didn't want to risk that. So instead, they decided that they needed to try and somehow get his DNA without him knowing. So they started looking into Scott Keefe and just finding out more about his life now, what his life looked like nearly a decade and a half after the crime in the late 90s. They actually found out that he was still living with his parents. He had lived with his parents at the time of Terry's murder, just like Terry was living with hers. And by 1998, he was back at his family home. He was a father by 1998. He had a child with a woman that he did actually marry but they eventually got a divorce and I think that was when he started living with his parents again. So the police found out his address, he was still living in Falls Township and something else that they also found out about Scott Keefe was that he was a smoker, he smoked cigarettes. In fact the police were even able to find out the exact type of cigarettes that he smoked and they started thinking okay maybe this this is how we can get his DNA. If we can secretly collect one of his cigarettes that he had smoked, we can compare the saliva on that 
to the killer's DNA and see if we have our match. So to try and do this, get one of his cigarette butts, the police kind of had a stakeout outside of Scott Keefe's home and they decided to secretly wait there until someone put out the trash because in Pennsylvania, the law is that once you've put your trash outside of the front of your house for the bin men, it's not yours anymore, I guess. It's considered abandoned property. So the police waited and waited and waited outside of his home until finally someone took the trash out. I don't know if it was Scott or his parents, but someone took the trash out. So the police quickly grabbed this trash bag, they took it to the lab, and luckily there were a couple of cigarette butts in there, which scientists were able to get what they believed was Scott's DNA profile from. And when this DNA profile was compared against the DNA of Terry's killer, what do you know? It was a match and the police now had the substantial evidence to link Scott Keefe to the crime. So armed with this DNA evidence, Scott Keefe was brought to the police station to be interviewed and they didn't let on at first that you know, he was now the prime suspect in the case. I think they just kind of made out like they were wanting to speak to everyone who was in Terry's life back then, just as like standard procedure when an investigation reopens. So he agreed, he came down to the station and initially they just started asking Scott questions about his relationship with Terry. And also I think for his account on the night that his fiance was killed, what was he doing that night? And I believe he told them just the exact same thing that he had told previous detectives in 1984 that he was at home sleeping. He said that he had wanted to go to the Roy Rogers restaurant to be with Terry as she was closing just to make sure that she was safe but because he was working early the next morning he decided not to and he decided to just stay home and get an early night. And so the police asked Scott if he wouldn't mind taking a polygraph test which he agreed to However, he failed this polygraph, which indicated to the police that he was lying. In addition to the polygraph, they also asked Scott if they could take some DNA and blood samples from him, which again, he agreed to. And of course, when his samples were tested, they were found to be an exact match to the killer's DNA, which had been retrieved from both the murder weapon, the knife, and also the DNA from underneath Terry's fingernails. And it appears as though it was after failing the polygraph test when Scott Keefe actually started to panic a little bit. He clearly realised at this point that the police were onto him and yeah, it was just like he went into full-on panic mode. He started saying very, very odd things, like, quote, I didn't mean for this to happen. But then apparently, after realising what he had just said, he would almost take it back in an instant and say things like, oh, but I, I didn't do it, I'm not the killer. But then shortly after, he would say another very incriminating thing. He said, quote, she came at me first. It seemed as though, slowly and gradually, Scott Keefe was actually starting to confess. So the detectives continued grilling him and questioning him and eventually this, this kind of semi-confession became a full confession. I think upon realising that the police now had evidence against him, that time was up, he decided to just finally admit that yes, okay, he was the killer. And eventually he gave the police his account of what really happened the night that his fiance, Terry Brooks, died. Scott Keefe said that on the night of the 4th of February, 1984, I think in the early hours of the morning, he went to the Roy Rogers restaurant where Terry was finishing off her work for the evening. She was doing her inventory, getting ready to lock up when obviously Scott arrived after closing, after all of the other employees had gone home and Terry let him in and he claimed that whilst they were inside of the restaurant an argument broke out between them because Terry actually told Scott that she didn't want to be with him anymore. She didn't like how jealous and possessive and controlling he had been and so she was cancelling the wedding. She did not want to be his wife and Scott said that this made him so, so angry. He was absolutely furious with Terry for trying to split up with him and it was like he just saw red. He was filled with such rage that he became violent towards Terry and he said that he punched her. He punched the woman 
woman that he claimed to love right in the face. And he said that from there, the violence just escalated. Terry was trying to push him away and fight him off. There was a violent struggle between them in the kitchen, which caused Terry's shoes to come off of her feet. He managed to get Terry onto the floor. And it was then when he started beating her, he was grabbing her head and just banging it on the hard floor repeatedly. He put his hands around her neck and started to strangle her. I mean, the fear that Terry must have felt during this horrific ordeal is just just awful to think about, to imagine how scared she must have been, probably knowing that she was about to die at the hands of the man who she once loved. The struggle continued and Scott said that at one point during the attack, one of the knives from the restaurant's kitchen fell onto the floor next to him and so he grabbed it and literally plunged it into Terry's neck. However, he realised that even after sustaining all of these injuries, she wasn't actually dead yet. As I said earlier, she would have been paralysed, but she was still alive. And so he grabbed the empty trash bag out of the bin in the kitchen and he wrapped it around Terry's head. And this, as we know, is what caused Terry to suffocate. And he said that afterwards, to try and cover his tracks, he decided to stage the crime scene scene so that it looked like a robbery. So he went into the office and he stole the $2,500 and then he he just left. He escaped the restaurant through the drive through window and then he just went back to his home, I'm guessing. And then to further cover his tracks, he pretended to be the one to effectively raise the alarm. If you recall, he went to Terry's house the following morning pretending to be this concerned fiance because Terry's car wasn't parked outside. It was like he just suddenly turned on this act and he, he kept up with this act for years and years until, of course, he couldn't anymore as the evidence against him in the late 90s was now overwhelming and so he confessed. And following this he was arrested on suspicion of murder. He was actually arrested on the 15th anniversary of Terry's death in February of 1999. He was charged with murder in the first degree which he pleaded guilty to and in the year 2000 he was sentenced to life in prison which as far as I'm aware is where he remains to this day. Apparently he is incarcerated in a prison in Western Pennsylvania. Finally, after more than a decade, Terry's family had the answers and the closure that they had been waiting for for so long. But I can imagine that it must have been such a shock for them though, to discover that it was Scott all along who had killed Terry. As I mentioned before, they always thought that Scott was a nice, genuine guy for the most part. So to find out that he was actually the one who had done this, who had taken Terry from them in the cruelest of ways, it must must have been so heart-wrenching for them. But that concludes this case. That is the solved case of Terry Brooks. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments down below. I would love to hear what you guys think. And also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be solved cases, unsolved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!